This is a re-recording of lecture one. Um, and uh, we are doing that because the original recording um, was uh, faulty. Uh, the sound was very bad and it was in fact not usable. Uh, this lecture is, as uh, a first lecture, sh lecture should be, uh, an introduction to the module, right? And we will be uh, talking basically about um, what we are going to be doing in this module and uh, how we are going to work together. So, uh, uh, the synopsis is, uh, right, we're going to talk about the course objectives first, very briefly, then we're going to go into uh, housekeeping, how are we going to work together, how you're going to submit your homeworks, how marking is going to be done, and so on. Then we're going to go again and talk about the course detail, the course objectives in, in more detail. Uh, look at a syllabus, uh, get a few study uh, tips, and then finally go into the, uh, you know, this general topic that is uh, generally introductory, uh, the programming language uh, universe. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about the history uh, and uh, the evolution of programming languages. Uh, so what do we plan to get, or what should you be hoping to get from this module? Uh, well. First of all, you should get to the point of appreciating the relationship between most mainstream programming languages. Um, there are many of them, um, and uh, in fact, all of them specify the same kind of computation in different ways. So understanding this relationship means understanding the core of computer science. Um, through this exercise, you should also be able to further your programming skills. And that comes from the fact that programming and is a problem solving uh, skill. It is built out of patterns, of solution patterns. Once the more solution patterns you see and the more solution patterns are you able to recognize in the problems that you have to solve, the easier it will be for you uh, to write programs, right? Because you just apply a recipe that solves a specific pattern. Um, again, this will lead further because we're, we are going to uh, look at so many solution patterns in so many languages. New languages are going to come very easy uh, for you after that. Um, you should also be able to understand the workings of compilers and interpreters. This is for the benefit of later uh, courses, such as uh, CS4212 and CS5216. It is also important because it gives you uh, an insight on the if inherent efficiency or inefficiency uh, of uh, programming languages. You, Through this exercise, you'll find out, for instance, that Java is inherently slower than C if you take one C program and convert it into Java, that can be done very fast, right, by the way, because you can just take the C program, uh, put, build a class around uh, the code and make all the uh, C functions into public methods, and then you should have a public working uh, uh, Java program, but you'll find out that the Java program is inherently slower. It's about 10 times as slow as the original C program. And there's a reason for that. It's because there are different principles applied in compiling those languages. Uh, and hopefully you will get to understand uh, this from this module. Um, we want also to understand aspects of large scale software development and how uh, they can be tackled at the programming language uh, level. What that means is that in general, software development is a very difficult, uh, large scale software development especially, is a very difficult uh, task. And there is a discipline called software engineering, which studies uh, methods of managing large scale software um, development. There are many aspects uh, um, involved in this, and most of these aspects are human related. And this, uh, at your level of competence, probably seems surprising because you're thinking that programming is a, uh, a precise science, an exact science and uh, it's mathematical in nature, it should be predictable, it should be deterministic, and what does the human factor have to do with it? Well, guess what? Uh, 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 when you build software in large teams, you have to uh, collaborate with many people. Colla human collaboration requires human cl communication, that's a difficult thing, and your mode 
uh, as part of uh, as as a member of that team, right? You're not always happy as a member of that team. Your mode will reflect into the quality of the software that you write. That's a in very interesting uh, uh, thing. There's a lot of uh, li literature on this topic. And one interesting aspect is that if you are such a programmer in such a team and you're not very happy, you feel very tempted to take various shortcuts you don't um, uh, want to spend too much time, you want to do your job and, and, and go away after that. Uh, you don't put your heart and soul into that program, right? And because of these shortcuts, there will be later bugs into the system, there will be for extra costs in um, related to the reuse of the software, the software not, will not be as reusable and not as cost effective as one may want. So the question for us as, as students and, uh, of um, programming languages is, can the programming language design right, cater for this kind of situations? Can we, at the programming language level, enforce program, programmer behaviors that will be conducive to um, large, to good or, or proper large-scale software development. And uh, that's what we're going to uh, be learning uh, when we talk about this aspect in this module. Uh, also, remember that languages are just means of communication between different entities. They could be between human and machine. They could be machines. Uh, by the way, so network protocols are also languages, right? So they're languages by which machines communicate with each other right we're not studying network protocols but it should be you should be aware that communication occurs at all levels and between humans human and human uh, uh, hum humans communicate with each other right so a language as a means of communication when it is well mastered will enhance communication skills and this will hopefully be a secondary um, uh, benefit of uh, you being in, in this module, taking this module. Uh, a bit of housekeeping, right? So we want to talk about uh, um, how can you how can you get in touch with me? Uh, what are the teaching modes? Uh, the, the various tools that we use in teaching uh, textbooks, assessment. Of course, assessment is uh, an important issue. And the software that you need to install on your computers in order to be able to follow this module. Uh, so, my details uh, are on this slide. Uh, my name is Razvan Vojku. There's my email, my office phone, and uh, my office numbers. Um, I will be putting up um, office hours once I know when my tutorials are. And uh, even in, in, during the office hours, you're welcome to just drop by unannounced. You don't need to do anything. But uh, if you want to see me outside of office hours, please email. Uh, I will make absolutely sure that I uh, make time for you. Uh, I prefer the afternoons, uh, but I'm not restricted to those. So if you need to meet and the only time you can meet is in the morning, uh, I will uh, make sure that I will accommodate you. Uh, it's a good practice to call the office phone before you come, just a few minutes before you come, so you make sure I'm uh, not out of the office uh, inadvertently just for a few minutes, right? So if I set up a time with you, I will definitely uh, come, but, you know, different uh, kind of emergencies arise every once in a while. So call the office first, make sure I'm in, and I'll, uh, I'm waiting for you. Um, it's no point in coming to my door and wait, waiting by my door till I show up. Um, etiquette. In terms of etiquette, uh, feel free to call me by my first name, which is Razvan. Uh, if you uh, prefer to be a bit more formal, uh, some do for some reason. Uh, if you prefer to do that, call me Dr. Voiku. Uh, avoid Dr. Razvan, Voiku, Prof or Sir, especially Prof. Um, Right, I find it a bit demeaning. It's like uh, you're not, you, whoever does that is not bothered to use a full word to address somebody. Um, for email openings, uh, by all means use dear or hi Rasban or dear or hi Dr. Voiku. Don't use dear prof, for instance. Uh, if you do that, I will reply with dear stud. Uh, 
right? Dear stud, as in SUTD. Uh, because, you know, if uh, I am a, I'm being addressed by an incomplete word, by the four letters of a word, by the first four letters of a word, I should be entitled to the same, to do the same uh, on my, on my, uh, in my reply. Um, I will ma always make sure that I uh, uh, spell your names correctly and I will try to pronounce them as well as I can and I will be sure to learn them during the class. Uh, so please afford me the same treatment. Um, teaching modes. Uh, so we're going to have lectures and tutorials. For the lectures, we're going to have lecture notes. Uh, which might contain supplementary readings, and they will be in a blog format. Um, right, so I'm going to show you one example here. Right, so the address given here, well, let's go to the first page, which is the page, page for today's module. Um, right, so this is the address. It also has an alias. It will appear later in the slides. Um, right, it is on a website. It's a, it's essentially a blog. And the nice thing about this blog is that after every paragraph, there's a link that you can click and you can add your comments. And of course, here you can ask questions, clarifications. You can make suggestions for improvement. Uh, and have a general discussion that is focused specifically on the topic of that paragraph, which for me will be of, of great help because of this focus, because I don't have to uh, go in the forum, read your command, then go through the notes, try to find it, try to upload it again. Here it's all immediate, right? I just click the edit link. I can go make changes. I can click and reply to you right away. Everything is very focused. And then later as you revise and as you read, you get the benefits of all the improvements and you also get the benefits of all the comments that you can read as you read through the text. And maybe that will help you clarify further or help you discuss further with your peers. Um, when you comment here, right? You will have to leave a name and an email. You don't have to register. So you may fill into these um, uh, fields anything you like. Um, but of course, if you want credit, so I, I will come later to assessment. If you want credit uh, in the form of marks, of course, for your comments, uh, everything that anything that will be helpful to the improvement of the materials will be, of course, credited. You, sh you better, you better um, uh, fill in the correct names and, and email so I can give you credit at the end. Uh, if you don't want to be bothered with the comments, you can turn it off. This uh, character here is zero and means that there are zero comments so far. And uh, uh, as comments are added by uh, readers, th that number will increase. Um, the comments are moderated, so I have to approve them before they show up on the site. Um, right, so um, you have the benefit of remaining anonymous if you want, but <laughs> you, if I don't like your comments, I will not allow them to be uh, posted. Okay, so uh, this is where we're going to um, uh, have our lecture notes, right? Uh, all the other materials will be uploaded to IVLE. Since we're uh, here working with the browser, let's uh, cover that aspect too. Uh, right, so uh, what's important here is that everything should be accessible through the lesson plan. All right, so the lesson plan is already filled in. All right, and um, there will be uh, links for the uh, for the lecture notes and all the materials that we want to uh, uh, to cover are linked from here. I will not bother to maintain a structured folder, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 structured folders for uh, the materials in the workbench, so they will be just dumped there in whatever order they they uh, can be, uh, because it's too much trouble to keep uh, 
to to have a structure in in two places right so it's um, enough to have it in the lesson plan um all right so you can see that the materials for the first two weeks are here uh, i will try to upload and make available uh, materials one week in advance just in case you want to take a look before the lesson uh, problem sets and tutorial uh, handouts will uh, be linked from here as well um, anything that is related to the lecture and you should know will be placed will be written in this area corresponding to the week when <laughs> the information is uh, valid right so uh, for instance uh, you we can see here that already I have planned the midterm the midterm will be in week 10 during the regular lecture slot um, material will be covered up to lecture 8 inclusive it's going to be eight open book and so on right so the information is here such information may appear uh, for other weeks as well and be sure to check this page uh, often all right um, another important aspect is that in the work bin we have now this folder called shared files that is writable by everybody so if you want to share anything with the rest of um, with, with your with your colleagues uh, feel free to dump files in there if you want to put in the solution for your tutorial so then when you come to the whiteboard uh, to present you can uh, have access to that file you can put it there as well um, all right but other than that I will not maintain a lot of structure here homework submissions will be on a per per problem uh, basis each problem will have its own submission folder folder uh, this will be explained uh, further when problem sets are released all right now all the lectures will be recording recorded there will be no simultaneous webcast however right so there will be a recording for every uh, lecture which will be uploaded in the media bin in the IVLE also we won't be following any textbook um, there will be references to optional textbooks and these will be the textbooks that I use to write the uh, my course notes uh, right and generally I will try to quote whenever I use a resource I'll try to quote it and if you want to go and check it for yourselves um, feel free to tutorials slash labs right so uh, officially we have tutorials which should be one hour each but I've taken the freedom of extending these to two hours and putting them in the labs uh, because uh, in in that uh, setting we have the convenience of everybody having a computer in front of them right so we can uh, actually try out our solutions see how they work make changes uh, and have a discussion based on that uh, the venue is the PC labs in the iCube right but it's a tutorial so you're still expected to prepare solutions and uh, discuss the solutions during class we're going to try to uh, run every solution on the machine and put it up on the uh, projector so that everybody can see and um, uh, you will have to demo it's best if you can demo your solution um, so uh, bring your file to the class uh, either dump it into the shared folder file or bring a thumb drive uh, or make it accessible on your own site which you can access from uh, the presentation PC in the lab. Uh, tutorials are also going to be screen uh, captured, right? Every single class that personally that I personally teach. So then you can use them for revision. You can peek into what the other class is doing. It might not be this. It's generally not the case that the same things will be discussed. Depending on the questions that arise from the class, we might discuss a variety of issues during tutorials so you may want to take a peek at what the other class is doing so that will give you an opportunity uh, to do so um, 
homework is uh, yet another mode of teaching. You might think that it's a mode of assessment. Well, I would say rather say that this is a mode of learning. Uh, I will release eight problem sets. Each problem set will have a number of problems. Um, all the problems will need solutions in multiple programming languages. There will be many optional components, and that will be explained shortly. Um, in general, we will try to reinforce concepts taught in class. Uh, we will also try to have exercises that require creative solutions so that uh, those of you who think that they might be bored during a class like this will not really have an opportunity to be bored. Uh, remember that programming is a skill. It requires practice. So uh, homework exercises are supposed to give you the opportunity to practice. And solving the homework exercise is the best preparation for exam. It's not really reading and studying, but rather doing, acquiring a skill. Programming is a skill, right? Like riding a bicycle. I already uh, discussed IVLE and showed you everything that is there, so it's no point in uh, going in detail into this slide. Uh, in, into this slide, what you have on this slide, however, is the um, the website for the notes, right? So uh, put it in your uh, browser, bookmark it, right, and access it uh, often, right? And and uh, do provide comments on your. Um, uh, on, on your reading. Um, also, IVLE has a forum, which I have forgotten to mention when I was uh, having the browser up. Uh, we will be, I will be reading the forum uh, on a regular basis, and you're very welcome to have your discussion there as well. Uh, and I'm definitely expecting that there will be plenty of discussions related to homework exercises in the forum, and I will be reading that and helping along trying to clarify things as often as I can. Uh, right, so so that's a valuable tool for our uh, module. Um, all right. Uh, we're saying that lecture notes are self-contained, but uh, I'll be using these textbooks, and there's a there's a, uh, a list here. Uh, believe, believe it or not, in each of them I have identified something that I would like to uh, use that does not appear in all the other books, but there's no one book that would uh, would satisfy my um, my vision of, for, for this module. So that's why we're trying to um, use as many resources as possible. Right, so more books here. And finally, we talk about assessment and feedback. So um, I would say that the marks that you're getting have two roles. One is uh, the role of feedback, right? You receive marks so you know how you're doing for yourself, and you use it as an indicator on how you should uh, tackle your own development and how, how should you improve further. Uh, the other is assessment, which is the part a part of every um, university course, you have to be assessed on your, on your performance. So I have divided these into uh, 40, into a 40-60 proportion. 40% 40 goes to feedback, 60 goes to assessment. So 40%, the, the marks that make up this part are in such a way that they reward the effort, essentially. So if you're making a steady effort, a steady and sincere effort, irrespective of your performance, even if your performance is somewhat uh, of lower quality, you should still be able to attain the maximum 40%. And I'm actually hoping that everybody in this class will. Um, all right. Um, so um, uh, we implement this as a CAP system. And uh, in one of the next slides, I will clarify this. right? But Anybody who puts in a decent level of effort should attain the maximum. Remember that. Uh, that's a promise. Um, all right. And you should take it seriously. Assessment is 60%. It's uh, pretty much what you're used to. There's going to be a midterm that accounts for 10% of your final grade, and a final exam that accounts for 50% of your final grade. Uh, this will emphasize, em emphasize knowledge rather than effort, right? So. Um, uh, we'll look at what you know 
and we won't care that much how long you took to acquire that knowledge. Um, and uh, they will be open book, right? And expect them to be rather tough. The reason for that is that uh, I'm expecting almost every student to get the 40% uh, from the uh, performance, continual assessment uh, component, right? The, the, the feedback com uh, uh, component. So uh, in line with um, the uh, guide, university guide, guideline, uh, guidelines for a course of this size, you're about 80 people, the, um, the average grade should be B+, plus, right? Which is uh, 70, right? Which sort of corresponds to, to 70 on a scale of 100. Um, so if everybody is getting a 40, right? In order to achieve an average of 70 overall, I have to get an average of 30 from final exam and midterm. Right, so that is rather low. Right, means that when you when you uh, in, in the midterm, the average mark will be five. Uh, right, and not and not more than that. And in the final exam, the average will be twenty-five. Uh, uh, remember that these are just numbers. Right, so and this will contribute to a final grade of B plus. And I'm promising that this will happen. The class will have a final grade of B plus. Um, so when you when you receive your marks, take that, uh, take all, all these into perspective, right? Your it's uh, not exactly what the mark is, but how the mark compares to the average that establishes your final grade. Okay. Uh, now the cap system for the feedback component. Let me explain how that works. So. Um, um, we will be giving out. I'll be giving out. Uh, a number of uh, problem sets with each of them with a number of exercises. Each ex exercise will have a certain weightage. If you add all the weightages of all these problems in all the homeworks, right, you will get a total of 60. However, I am going to put a cap on the homework at 35, meaning that you know if out of your all your homework exercises you score uh, 40. You're going to have five marks forfeited. If you score 45, you're going to have 10 marks forfeited, and so on and so forth, right? Um, so the reason for that is why? Well, you you can take two approaches. You can say, well, I'm going to solve a small number of exercises perfectly, and then attain the cap the 35, and then not solve any more exercises, and then have half a semester free, or or you know just have a lighter load, maybe out of every problem set, you don't solve every single problem, you skip uh, one or two problems every once in a while. Um, however, you may be in the case where your performance is not so stellar. So you may get something like, you know, uh, half or a bit more than half of the grade for each problem. In which case, if you put in a steady effort and you keep solving and solving and solving exercises, right? By the end, after having solved all the exercises, you still get a potentially a score of 35, right? Which is the maximum. And in this way, we're not penalizing slow learners and we're rewarding the effort. If you're putting effort constantly, even though your performance is not stellar, we still give you a chance of achieving the maximum score for that component. We're going to have caps, cap systems for tutorials and forum contributions as well. I'm going to reward every single tutorial contribution, but there's going to be a cap of 10, right? So once you get more than 10 marks, the excess is forfeited. Forum contributions in the same way. I'm going to give credit to good forum contributions, but that's going to be subjective. Don't expect a lot of marks coming out of the forum, your forum contributions, but you will receive some credit. Um, and uh, well, some people are uh, take great pleasure in discussing and uh, adding information and helping their peers, clarifying their doubts, right? And they will be rewarded. So there's a cap of five. I um, often gotten uh, people with as many as 20 marks out of their forum contributions. They contributed so much that you know they just had to be rewarded. Uh, but there's a cap of five. And then there's an overall cap, 
of 40 for everything, right? So if you're make if you're getting 35 in the homework, 10 in the tutorial, and 5 in uh, the forum, which totals 50, you still have another cap, cap of 40 for the overall continual assessment component. Now, what happens with uh, the ex the marks that were forfeited? They will be entered in a contest, right? So whoever has more more forfeited marks uh, uh, wins, and there will be a little reward at the end. There will be some prizes that will be uh, offered to the winners of these competitions, right? So uh, don't despair. It's not completely lost, right? And you must know that in, in previous years, I often had uh, situations where, uh, you know, maybe 20% of the class will not stop when reaching 35. They will submit good solutions. They would get high scores. They will attain the uh, score of 35 somewhere in the middle of the semester, right? But that will not prevent them from, that will not stop them from uh, submitting. They will continue to submit till the end of the semester. They will get scores very close to 60. They will get high scores in tutorials. They will get high scores in the forum as well. And when there would be marks forfeited, there would be like, they will have like 40 or 50 marks forfeited. Which is, which is amazing. It's a very good thing. I'm very happy that uh, these people had a blast uh, going through uh, the, the module, uh, right? And uh, then, on the other hand, I will have the students who uh, did not do so well. They barely got the 40, but they made it there nevertheless. And uh, hopefully that was encouraging for them to continue uh, to, to work, uh, right? <clears throat> because this is the purpose of this component, to encourage you to continue working. Um, all right, so this uh, was all about uh, housekeeping. housekeeping. So let's go on and talk about course objectives. Uh, these are the course objectives that we have mentioned, mentioned originally, but we want to go into a bit more detail, so we're going to devote one slide to each of the bullets on this slide. Um, so let's go very quickly through uh, the course objectives again. We want to appreciate the relationship between most mainstream programming languages. We want to allow you to further your programming skills. We want to uh, allow you to learn, uh, to, to make it easier for you to learn new languages. Uh, we want a bit of insight into the workings of compilers and interpreters. We want to understand uh, how, at the language level, we can support large-scale program development, right? This, we'll see later, uh, uh, deals almost exclusively with object-oriented programming. Um, and we want to enhance communication skills. We were saying that pro languages, programming languages are languages, are means of communication, uh, right? And one important thing, uh, we're, we're going to talk about this later, is that, that when you communicate, especially when you communicate with a machine and you, you communicate through a language that is so constrained, right? Programming languages are very precise, very constrained. You don't have a lot of freedom, right? You start understanding what kind of expectations you should have about your conversation counterpart, you know, your conversation partner. What should you expect of him, even if it's a human being? Uh, and and uh, uh, I think that's a skill that I particularly acquired uh, from uh, as a programming language specialist, if you will. All right, so relationship between languages. Uh, it will surprise you probably that there are over 1,000 programming languages in existence, with some 25 in widespread use, relative widespread use. Each of them has a different perspective on performing uh, computation and, and uh, you know, software development. Um, it, these languages are tools and they, the right tool should be picked for the right purpose, right? It's just a tool. Some programs would be amenable for being solved in a certain la language. Some will, some other languages would be better for, for other problems, right? So uh, don't expect the universal language and learn how to use each language for its own strength. Um, definitely don't become religious about languages and don't adopt one single language as your only programming language, 
uh, that will not help you survive in um, professionally. Um, all right, so um, uh, it's often the case that external constraints actually impose a specific language. Um, you might think that, well, this problem, uh, because of its nature, is very amenable to be solved in Python, right? But then if you're part of a programming team, of a software development team, you will have a project manager above you who will come and have completely different considerations. One of them being, you know, how easy it is to find new Python programmers in on, on the market, right? It may be the case that the programming language of interest is uh, one that is not so widespread, so then it's not so easy to find programmers. And the programming, the program, uh, sorry, the project manager will think that, well, you may leave any time. He can't take the risk any programmer may decide to leave the project and will have to be replaced, will have to be replaced by uh, somebody relatively quickly with a similar set of skills who will be, who should be able to read the sources that were left behind, right? Get up to speed and continue with developing the project, right? And, and uh, uh, if for that particular language, People with that kind of skill are very rare on the market, of course, you would not want to risk the situation where, when you can't find somebody or you have to overpay somebody, right? So these are kinds of considerations that, that uh, drive the choice of a programming language in, um, uh, in a project, uh, right? They are... Um, definitely different from what you would imagine at your current level of competence that they would be. Um, all right, so one important question, if we if we want to understand the relationship is, how do we convert our solution from one language to another? This uh, problem is very, very, very important. So it's the problem that we should highlight here. How do we convert our solution from one language to another? We want to be able to do that in a systematic manner, right? So what you'll often see uh, in, in this module that we take one program in C and convert it into some other language, scheme, let's say, right? But whenever we do that, we want to do that systematically in a way that leads to any other C program being translated into its corresponding scheme counterpart, for instance, right? So we want to be able to develop systematic translation schemes. Right, which is uh, pertains to the skill of converting from one language to another at will. All right, uh, furthering your programming skills. That will happen naturally. Um, remember that, that in writing a program, we have two parts. Uh, I was emphasizing this a bit earlier. There's a problem solving part where you find the solution, uh, or better said, you find a solution pattern. And then you have to express the solution in a programming language. And in our exploration of programming languages, we will look at many solution patterns and how they can be more easily or more complicatedly expressed in one particular language or another, right? Certain, particular, certain uh, uh, solution patterns are easy to express in some language and not so easy in others, right? And this is why we have so many languages after all. But going through so many solution patterns will create a repertoire and will create solution uh, implementation patterns, right, from different languages. And having built this uh, repertoire of, pro of, um, of solution patterns, get what, guess what? Your programming skills will improve, right? Because programming is very much the ability to recognize a certain solution pattern and apply the construct from a programming language that implements that solution pattern, right? So naturally, your programming skill will increase. Um, it's uh, also, uh, um, what about new programming uh, languages? Whenever we create new programming languages, well, the interesting thing is uh, that, in fact, what we have is a relatively small number of components that can be mixed and matched. It's pretty much like a Lego game, 
right? We have a number of paradigms, we, find, we, we have a number of features, and you can pretty much pick and mix together and create a new language, right? Um, each of these components would render a certain expressive power with respect to a specific solution. So when we say expressive power, we mean how easily can we express a certain solution, a certain solution pattern, right? So as I was saying, given a solution pattern, some languages have a very complicated way of expressing it. Some other languages have a very easy way of expressing exactly that, right? But it's not universal, right? It's not the case that all solution patterns can be easily expressed in some language. Um, um, all right, so uh, in some languages you can see that how, how these, um, how, how this mixing, how this assembly like, uh, like Lego pieces was performed. Uh, for instance, if you take Python, right, you can see exactly the influences. You can, if you take Ruby, the same, you can see exactly the influences. There's the C, uh, uh, Perl, the shell script bash, right? The shell script, uh, sometimes uh, small talk, right? And actually, if you look on um, the course notes corresponding to today's lecture, you'll, you'll find a diagram that shows how languages have influenced uh, each other, right? But in the case of Python and, and uh, Ruby, you can see how, you know, this feature was taken from that language and put into the, current, the, the, the language of interest just to make it available and how that other feature, right? And so they didn't, whoever made that language didn't like the particular mixture of features in all the other languages and they just took the features that they liked and put them in one language to make it, to make it palatable for themselves. Um, okay, so, so remember that. A few components combined pr pretty much like Lego bricks. Uh, workings of compilers and interpreters. Why is that important? Um, uh, first of all, um, there are many there are many uh, interesting uh, uh, aspects in the implementation of programming languages that will will be useful <coughs> for many other modules and and um, especially for for modules that have to deal with implementation of programming language, of course. Um, one, one such uh, topic that comes from the inner workings of compilers and, and interpreters is semantics. Uh, they, these will help you reason about program correctness, for instance. Uh, also, you will have some sort of an idea of what the processor is doing while executing your program, right? Will give you some idea of the execution time. You'll understand, for instance, why C programs are much faster than Java programs. The same program, right? Written with the same algorithm. C and Java are syntactically very, um, very similar. So you can pretty much do a one-to-one -one translation from C to Java. You'll see that the corresponding Java program is about 10 times slower. Uh, also, memory usage, right? We'll learn, for instance, that when we implement procedures, there's an inherent stack consumption that ha that is um, uh, that that corresponds to execution of procedures. Uh, when we do recursion, that memory consumption can go very high, uh, except for the case when, uh, in some languages, we have an optimization called tail recursion optimization which can make some of the recursive procedures, not all, some of them can make them pretty much as efficient as iterative, as similar as, as the corresponding iterative procedure, right? So, so this will give you a good idea of, you know, what's happening at the low level uh, um, and uh, how does your program, uh, your, your program may be more or less efficient and you will be able to gauge that from the from just the way you write it and thinking of the compilation model that is uh, available. Um, also, another issue is that of programming platform, right? Java, for instance, it's portable and uh, has a certain kind of program platform that ensures that. C, on the other hand, is not so portable, but then it is a language that is implemented in specific ways of every on every platform in such a way that it allows uh, the development of systems software, right? And that's an important aspect as well. And, and you will have a different kind of generic platform for uh, C. Whenever you implement a C compiler, you will have different considerations to make. 
Um, so uh, in, in this respect, we're going to try to understand the role of the compiler linker loader, um, right? What happens when the operating system uh, takes your program and starts executing it? All right, as uh, for large scale software development, um, right? Um, as I was saying, uh, uh, in large teams, the most expensive aspect is not the programmer sitting in front of a computer and writing code, but it's the programmer trying to understand specifications and trying to agree with other programmers on a certain course of action. Uh, all right, and, and it's the, the, the highest costs come from human interaction mostly. And uh, programmers can help here by trying to minimize communication. We'll see that, that for instance, in an in object-oriented uh, program, and especially in Java, where we have interfaces defined for classes, right, that helps establishing a sort of contract between implementers of different modules, and that helps somehow minimize communication and give more freedom for the for, to a programmer to when he is implementing his own module. Within the module, he has freedom. He has to abide by the interface contract. But beyond that, it's his own job. Nobody can peek into his code and uh, uh, take advantage of whatever code is there. Uh, so these are important aspects. These are, this is what made uh, adds robustness to code and made object-oriented, for instance, uh, object-oriented programming um, uh, such a success in terms of large-scale uh, software development. Um, all right, so so the, how can the language help? The language can enforce a programmer behavior, a certain kind of program behavior that helps minimize development developments of um, uh, software. Uh, sorry, costs of software development. All right. Uh, communication skills. Well, if you um, if you become an expert in communicating with such a dumb entity that is the computer, you'll definitely learn improve your communication skills, and that will reflect in the way you communicate with other humans for sure. Right. One important aspect is to to develop a certain ex uh, realistic expectation of what your conversation partner can understand whenever you communicate with that conversation partner. That conversation partner may be a human or a machine, right? But always think of what is the processing power that is there, that is available there. All right. Um, the syllabus, we're going to be trying to uh, go through all these uh, topics. Uh, so we are talking now about, you know, concepts, classifications, bird's eye view of programming language universe. Um, we're going to try next time to go into assembly languages and uh, their relationships with C. Um, we're going to next uh, uh, go and talk about grammars and regular expressions, which are uh, uh, important tools for implementing languages. Uh, then we're going to uh, start talking about the Lego bricks that make up a language, right? So these are data types and expressions. Um, when we have that, we can talk about sequential programming and we can talk about semantics. And here we're going to introduce the language prologue, which is an excellent tool for language manipulation. It's a very narrow language. It doesn't have a lot of applications, but it's excellent for precisely that. So we can write an interpreter for a language that resembles C. We can write that interpreter in prologue in about 20 lines of code. That is pretty much amazing. Uh, and and uh, this goes to emphasize expressivity, uh, for instance. So pro prologue is very expressive when it comes to, pro to, to language manipulation. It's not so expressive when it comes, for instance, to numeric computations. Um, and uh, but it's a particular kind of problem. It's the right tool, and it will also give us an insight into a new programming paradigm, which is rule-based programming. All right. Uh, after that, we're going to go into stateful and non-stateful programming. Uh, non-stateful programming is programming without assignment. Imagine that some languages do not have assignment, and you can do pretty much everything in those languages as well. Right? The lack of assignment doesn't really 
preclude us from doing anything. Uh, one very important to topic is going to be procedural abstraction, implementation of procedures. Procedures are a staple of all programming languages. Uh, there are certain uh, choices that you have to make when you implement procedures and that affects performance. So we want to understand um, as well as we can uh, this building block of all programming languages. Later we're going to move into lazy evaluation and uh, that's going to be an interesting topic. Well, um, it, we are lazy not in the sense that we are slow, so or, or languages are lazy in, not in the sense that they are slow um, in, in doing something, but rather in the fact that they defer, they procrastinate, they defer uh, computations till the last moment, till they realize that these computations are really necessary. And you will be amazed to see how that a lot of computations are performed unnecessarily in most programming language languages, and, and lazy uh, computing is trying to do exactly that. Uh, reduce or eliminate all redundant computation. Uh, then the issue of types. Types can help us uh, in, in many ways. Uh, the most basic use is where they specify the size of the data which the compiler needs in order to reserve space for uh, every piece of data. But they can, can go as and become as sophisticated uh, as to specify a certain level of correctness in the program. For instance, uh, when you have container objects in Java, like a list of objects, if you put an object of a certain type in the list, that's at least with Java 1.6, right? Uh, so if you put an object of a certain type, let's say an integer, into the list, later when you extract from that list an element, you can only assign it to an integer, right? So the, the type of a, it's, just, it's not a list of objects anymore, but it's a list of integers, right? You can specialize the list type to become a list of integer, integers, so you can only put inside integers and then later extract integers. And then if you're trying by mistake to assign the element of a list to an object that is not of type integer, then the compiler can complain. And there you go, uh, 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 something that otherwise would have become a bug becomes a compiler error and you can eliminate it up front. It's detected. It's detected in a systematic manner. Um, also a very important topic, object-oriented programming. We're going to try to understand why this helps with large software development. Um, all right. Why, why is that uh, so successful? Uh, then the rest of the topics, <coughs> I'm sorry, are pretty much standard. Um, topics uh, of programming languages. Uh, we can't assign a lot of importance to them. They are um, interesting and they make uh, for choices that you have to take when you design a language. Um, so we have exception handling, event handling, modules, components, reusability, robustness, robust, robustness. Or, or we have embedded languages. Oh, and by the way, uh, for instance, uh, uh, an embedded language is JavaScript. Uh, which is implemented inside a browser. That's what it means. It's implemented inside an application and allows tweaking an application, um, uh, tweaking an application uh, through the language, right, in a programmatic manner. So, for instance, in in uh, Firefox, we can write JavaScript uh, math dot sqrt. Of, let's say the value 2 and the browser will immediately respond with that value so we can compute expressions JavaScript expressions from inside we can actually from from this prompt we can actually do a lot of other stuff open new windows um, uh, right put up buttons I don't know access sites and cache them uh, whatever other um, 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 facilities are available in JavaScript, and we will actually devote some time to JavaScript. Other examples of um, uh, embedded languages are uh, PHP, um, right, which is embedded on the server side, um, and, and it can be embedded into 
uh, files that are to be converted into HTML files. Um, Visual Basic is embedded into the Microsoft. It, it can be used as a standalone language, but it is also embedded in the Microsoft Office suite. So uh, you can write macros uh, for Microsoft Word or Excel. Um, and there are many other examples. The oldest um, embed language was Lisp in the editor called Emacs, <coughs> which is available in uh, Unix. Um, but there are many, many other um, examples. Python appears embedded in many uh, in many applications nowadays. Uh, another embedded language is Lua, very uh, uh, very fashionable. So in uh, it's, it's on the rise. Um, yeah, and, and SQL. SQL is also embedded in C programs, into C programs or into PHP programs. or So you have a, an extra layer of uh, embedding, right? You have an HTML um, file that has an embedded PHP program in it and, and uh, which makes SQL queries, so sends SQL queries to an SQL server. Um, and we're going to look at uh, these uh, situations uh, briefly, rather. We don't have a lot of time, but we're going to try to understand how these things work. Um, also, very briefly, we're going to look at rule-based programming and uh, constraint programming. I skipped concurrency. We're actually going to devote a bit more time to concurrency. We're going to uh, look at the languages Oz and Go, which have very interesting concurrency models. Go is the new language from Google. Um, then briefly, rule-based programming. We already be familiarized with rule-based programming because we uh, would have written a few pro programs uh, like an interpreter for a language, then also a type analyzer when you talk about types uh, and so on. Uh, constraint programming is one of the most expressive paradigms, and we're going to use it to solve puzzles. Uh, you're going to see that very very complicated puzzles have very short uh, constraint programs uh, that can give you um, the answer out of the box. Um, also, a relatively important issue is uh, metacircularity and reflection, uh, all right, available in quite a few languages. And it's roughly the ability of a language to change itself in a certain manner, right? And uh, the degree of freedom here varies from one language to another. It's, uh, well, some languages are limited to just inspecting themselves. So that's Java. Java, it can inspect itself, or it can inspect other classes and understand how they are uh, constructed, but it cannot change them. But there are some other languages, such as, for instance, Ruby, which can change itself dynamically. Um, <clears throat> All right, and, and if we have time, we're going to look at a bit at parser and lexer generators and domain-specific languages, but we'll see how we go. We might actually not have time for that. Languages covered, well, quite a few, and, and I would recommend that you install all these softwares uh, on your machine, so then you would have them available. Um, all the examples that are given, you will have full examples with uh, explanations of on how they work, and then you would be asked to change or tweak these languages to these programs to have a slightly different, uh, uh, to solve a slightly different problem, right? Um, <clears throat> you don't need to learn these languages in full to pass this course. Or you, in, in general, the guideline is that what you will need for, for, the, for a solution to a problem, you only need the course notes and whatever is provided in the problem set to solve it. You don't, you shouldn't need to consult any other source. Um, <clears throat> right? Um, um, but you need to have all these softwares installed, all these uh, language implementations installed. So there's the Pentium assembly language. Uh, we're going to showcase a few examples here and there. Um, we're we're going to need uh, a C and C++ uh, compiler. And it's good to have both the GCC in either Linux or Sigwin, whatever uh, uh, you feel comfortable with, or also you, it's, it's good to have uh, Visual Studio Express ed edition, right? Because it it gives you a different perspective on a compiler, on a language that is very widespread, right? 
Java, you probably already know, all the resources uh, are on the web. You can download the compiler and uh, maybe a development environment such as BlueJ or uh, Eclipse. <coughs> C Sharp, uh, also available through Visual Studio Express Edition. Scheme, there's the uh, one of the best scheme interpreters, there are, th though there are many around. Uh, we're going to use Prolog and CLP, and there's two compilers there, and I'm going to be using the first one, but I'm going to try to make programs as compatible with both as possible. There's also Camel uh, and Haskell, which we will use for our lessons on types. Uh, Python, we're going to be using quite a lot of Python. It's a popular language nowadays, and I am going uh, to quite often uh, ask you to have the equivalent in Python of something, or uh, just just for for um, uh, kicks more or less, right? Uh, you will see that, for instance, Python has lots of influences from a language like Haskell. Uh, it has also lots of influences from a language like Java. So it combines a lot of features together, uh, and it's a fun language to, to work in. Uh, we're going to look at a few JavaScript examples. We're going to look at a few PHP examples. We're going to look at a few SQL examples. Uh, not too many. We're going to use Oz and Go. The Go is the new Google, uh, new, new language from Google. Uh, we're going to use them for their concurrency model. So we're going to uh, look at a few interesting concurrent programming examples. Um, we're going to look, uh, look at Ruby. Ruby has, uh, unlike all the other uh, progra uh, programming languages, has um, regular expressions as um, first class values. And that's, that, that's unique. When we talk about languages and grammars uh, and regular expressions, uh, we're going to use Ruby as an example because it has a few features that make the learning of regular expression is very easy. <clears throat> Bash is uh, also available in Lux and Sigwin. We're going to use a few examples, not a lot. And then AutoHotkey is the only language I know, there might be others, uh, for event-driven programming. Most um, uh, other platforms have libraries for event-driven programming, but they're not specifically languages for event-driven programming. This is the only one I know. Uh, so we're going to look a bit uh, at it uh, and uh, at a few examples and try to understand this issue as well. Um, so finally, uh, we go into study tips. Um, <clears throat> and uh, right, I would like to, to uh, discuss a few aspects that hopefully will make your learning experience better. Um, uh, and I'm going to devote one slide to each of these topics. Why is it difficult to learn programming? What is What are typical beginner's misconceptions? Uh, the fact that you have to practice all the time as much as possible. The fact that you come in, 